Okay, looks like we still got some people joining, but I'll get through the kind of housekeeping stuff, and hopefully everybody's uh, online by the time we get to the good, the good stuff. So today we're going to be focusing on you know some tips and tricks to get your analytical uh, applications and projects going faster. Uh, and I'm really excited to have Aaron from the Looker team joining us. Um, and we'll do the introductions just in a second. But so f as far as the recording, that'll be sent out afterwards. Uh, every Everybody that's an attendee is obviously muted, but we will be doing some Q&A at the end, so please put your questions in the chat box if you have them. We'll definitely make our best effort to get to them during the session today, but if there's anything uh, that we don't get to, we'll definitely follow up afterwards. Um, so I'm Colin. Uh, I'm on the Kabula team. I've been here for a couple of years, and I've worked in the kind of BI and analytics space for several years now. Um, and Aaron, do you want to go ahead and just do a quick intro on yourself? Yeah, sure. I'm Erin. I, uh, I work in technology alliances at Looker. Uh, so I work across a bunch of our different technology partners. I've been at Looker for three years on both the technical and the business side. Awesome. Thanks. And thanks again for joining us. So getting started. So the focus for today and for most of our kind of data product learning series is, is more on the strategy portion. Uh, we, we, we will be talking about the Looker and Kabula technology a little bit at the end. But the, the whole point is really to give you some tips and tricks on your own analytics projects. Um, and obviously, a lot of the stuff that we're covering today is stuff that we've learned through the multitude of projects we've helped our customers deliver um, and hope that you find some of this helpful and insightful. Uh, so the initial uh, focus will just be what's, what's an MVP or minimum viable product. I think it's a fairly known quantity, so we're not going to spend a ton of time there. Uh, most of the presentation is going to be focused around how you can actually apply this concept to your analytics or embedded analytics projects. And then we're going to go over some examples of customers who have applied this successfully uh, and you know how that was helpful in their process. So Aaron's going to be talking about PDX Inc. and Urban Airship, and then I'll be talking about Zoom International and Health Space. Uh, and again, these are just some, some examples that we're going to go over to kind of highlight some of the strategy or tactics that we're going to go over uh, in the first part of the webinar. So what is a minimum viable product? Uh, it is really a technique or process that you approach for each of the, I mean, typically it's kind of in the agile development or launching a new product, but it can also be applied to launching an analytics application. And really the, the point is to figure out what is the kind of minimum level of features you need to help somebody do their job better uh, in the case of analytics. Uh, and then knowing that it's going to be a learning process to help you determine what is the final set of features and functions that you need to deliver to, you know, kind of satisfy that, uh, problem that you're initially trying to tackle. Uh, and the whole point is to get something in front of users sooner so you can use that actual feedback to build out on the project. Um, so really the benefits being, again, learning and learning faster, actually getting a better understanding of the, the purpose for the analytics that you're building, and being able to take an agile approach to development. So things like what are you trying to achieve? What are the actual business problems you're solving with the analytics? Uh, who are you, your users? Who's involved in the project? And what technology do you need to support it? So that's kind of the whole purpose of the MVP process, because these are a lot of assumptions you're making at the outset. Uh, and the idea is by um, using that feedback earlier in the process, you can uh, you know, either prove or disprove those assumptions. So uh, in a typical project, you may be months down the road uh, with your analytics as far as you know, building out the back end and building out the dashboards before you're actually putting it in front of users, which makes it really difficult to, to determine uh, the solution's viability. You know, is it actually solving a business case? And is your solution actually delivering value that you're trying to create? The whole point is to, again, prove or disprove these assumptions sooner because from the outset, a lot of it's guesswork. Uh, what isn't an MVP? Uh, it shouldn't have every possible feature or function of the final product you're, you're aiming to deliver. And it's also important not to get too hung up on things like, uh, I wish that paint was red instead of blue. These are issues that you can definitely fix and should take note of, but shouldn't get in the way of the speed of the MVP process. And it's also not a giant binder of waterfall requirements with 100 different user stories. It's really important, um, you know, again, to record this feedback, but again, this is actually part of the development process for the next phase of your product. Um, so if you're 
just getting hung up on making sure that it does every possible thing, you're not actually getting the benefit of the kind of minimum viable product process uh, for building your analytics. And it's also not just you know winging it randomly. This this is something you should be planning out uh, and knowing what success looks like. So uh, you know which of your your users are the analytics for this MVP focused on? What are their kind of top challenges? Which is what we're, we're going to get into next. Uh, and then again, what are the minimum set of features you need to solve those problems? Uh, and then again, keeping in mind that this is a, a starting place for a broader you know analytics build out. Uh, so you should know that once you get to you know the finish line for your MVP, yes, this works. Already have a plan in place for what you're going to do next. And then uh, so what we're going to get into next, right, is how you can actually apply this this process uh, or methodology to you know data products or embedded analytics or, or you know whatever analytics project you're working on. So for us, there's kind of three key considerations. The first one I'm going to get into is user scope. Um, you know, going with the agile development methodology, it's always start with your user, and then we're going to go to, you know, how do you uh, align that with your product, and then what data do you need to support it? So as far as user scope, again, like, you're, this is this is the, the whole starting point. You can't really know what you need to build or what data you need to support it if you don't know who you're talking about. And what I mean here is, like, who are the key users of your application or your analytics? Uh, and I think typically there's going to be you know, several different possibilities. Uh, it could be a, a high level, you know, kind of VP of operations type. It could be more of a day-to-day -day tactical type of manager, or it could even be, you know, kind of down to the, you know, agent or user level. Uh, and these are definitely things that, you know, as a product person, you know, you kind of have mapped out ahead of time, but um, it's important to actually pick a really high value persona to start with. and and what I mean by this is going to those three different levels. You know, you kind of have your VP or high-level uh, operations person, you have your tactical manager, and you have your agent. Those are all important people to keep in mind, and you do want to make sure each one of these levels does have, uh, you know, the data they need. But for a starting place for an MVP, you really want to get traction with somebody as high up on that food chain as you can. Uh, and the reason being... Uh, a lot of the times, especially when we're talking about embedded analytics or data products, these are potentially things you're going to charge for. Uh, and so the the higher value person that you can serve analytics to, the more likely you are to be able to actually kind of monetize that data. Uh, and this is actually one of the things that we like to focus a lot in our kind of product workshops we do, where it's really, you know, picking a user persona and really digging into, you know, what are their pain points, what are their challenges, and where can we actually use analytics in their workflow to make their life easier. And it's important when you're kind of going down this MVP path not to try to serve everybody. If you just kind of throw a bunch of charts on a dashboard and think that that's going to you know, make the money start pouring in, it's not. Uh, there may be some initial excitement and you know everyone always likes to see you know, the new toy in the, in the playroom, but the problem is if you're not actually tailoring it to a specific person and a specific workflow, uh, at the end of the day, it's not going to help anyone's life. It's not going to make it's not going to make their job easier. Uh, and if you're not making their job easier or making them more effective, then the analytics at the end of the day aren't going to do what you're initially intending them to do. So what you really need to do is pick one of those personas. We'll just say a, you know a VP of ops for for uh, this sake, and actually look at their job and pick two or three problems that you can actually solve. Uh, with with the data. Um, it's not something that's like a nice to have or oh you know I wish uh, you know I wish I had this one thing uh, but it doesn't really help them. It's actually two to three things where it's really you know they're literally leaving your application and having to go to a, a legacy system and pull a report and then go back to your application and, and continue you know working. It's something that's actually irritating them um, a, a real a real struggle, uh, and clearly define this problem. You know what? So, what's their mission? Uh, you know, for example, if, if they're going into their CRM and running a couple of reports, yeah, that's maybe their process. What's their actually mission in doing that? What are they trying to accomplish? Uh, and what in in this process is preventing them from doing their job as well or as easily or as effectively as they would like to do? Why and why can't they do it today? And you know, what again? If you can actually find these you know, specific people with these really specific problems, 
would they potentially be willing to actually pay an additional, you know, monthly fee or however you're going to charge for it uh, to, to solve them. So for, for example, we were working with an education software company earlier this year uh, and we were targeting kind of a high value manager persona uh, and, and literally the person had to leave the application and it took them about 10 minutes to go to a really old piece of legacy software, run a couple of reports, then go back and resume and you know they have all those uh, facts about you know it takes five minutes or 30 minutes to change from task to task or whatever it is but you know these are a problem where the whole the whole reason someone's using an application you know be it analytics or otherwise is to do something and any, anytime they have to leave you know that's just a disturbance in their workflow so if you can actually keep people within your application longer you're adding more value and helping them you know that's only gonna uh, help you so the next one would be product scope and product scope is really what is you know based on these users and their challenge and the challenge we're focusing on like what is the minimum amount of functionality that we need to deliver to solve those problems and again keep in mind you want you want to make sure that this is something usable but you don't want to spend so much time developing it that you know it's going to take as long as the final product would have the point is okay we pick these two to three top challenges for this particular persona what's the minimum amount of functionality we need to solve these problems so the first thing to keep in mind here is that, uh, again, this MVP is a part of a wider product analytic strategy. So yes, it's something you're going to deliver, but the whole point is to get some feedback for the next iteration of the product. You don't just want to, you know, build a couple of reports and then that's it. It's actually supposed to be the, the starting place or the first phase in a longer rollout. And again, focusing on core functionality. So you don't want to you don't want to build in every possible feature or every possible function for a few reasons. Uh, one, it leads to lack of focus. Uh, you know, again, if you're focusing on well, every every time you get a piece of feedback, oh, they they want this chart to be a different color. I mean, those are fine, and again, things you should take note of. But the whole point is to get something in front of people and see if it's helpful. Uh, also, trying to build out too many functions too early can, you know, lead to product instability, which is which is a big challenge. Um, and again, the whole focus is is this product solving the problems that it's designed to solve. Uh, you know, some of those other things might be nice, but is it actually doing what it's supposed to, or are we just putting something that looks really cool but doesn't really do anything in front of people? And it's important to kind of agree to the you know top three to five attributes that make this analytics product compelling and focus on those uh, because the whole point here is learning uh, not perfection so you know in this case I would say perfect is definitely the enemy of good uh, and it's it, perfection is not the point of the MVP time is really the critical uh, you know resource here you know, the faster you can build something get it in front of people and start collecting feedback uh, the better and you know by focusing on perfection it can also really, really uh, it's kind of a detriment to determining the viability of the business case and that's the whole point is figuring out you know is this solving a, a business problem and actually delivering value to the users that we're putting it in front of um, and you know kind of as I highlighted in the uh, uh, Chris blog by Henrik uh, Nyberg you know it, they made the analogy of you know if your final product is supposed to be a car wouldn't it be a lot better to start with a skateboard than a wheel right the skateboard actually gets you somewhere faster the wheel in and of itself doesn't do anything. So the whole point is, you know, get something out there that's trying to solve the problem. Any of the feedback you get during that process is great and it can be kind of used in the next phase, but it shouldn't stop you from, you know, proceeding through this initial phase. And one of the other big challenges we found is it's typically not the technology, uh, it's actually the strategy where you're gonna run into trouble. You know, even if you have the best technology in place and some really smart people, if you're not really planning out you know, again, who you're targeting, what their challenges are, and beyond. Uh, again, you need to actually know if the MVP is a, as a success, what next? Um, this is where you're going to run into trouble. You know, I mean, we were working with a, a company earlier this year that had a ton of domain expertise and wanted to make some prepackaged analytics they were going to sell, uh, and they they thought that they knew that who their user was and you know who was going to be paying for this and what their top challenges were. But yeah, at the end of the day, after spending a few months trying to build this thing out and then finally getting it in front of somebody realized that they didn't. Uh, so 
it's not field of dreams, right? Just because you build it, that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll come. So it's really important to focus on, you know, one, your user, who actually is it specifically? Um, and, you know, one of the good, one of the ways to do this is actually, you know, survey your, your if it's an app, existing application, survey your existing users and try to find some power users to chat, to, you know, talk through their top challenges. Uh, and then two, based on what they're trying to do, um, how, what minimum amount of features do you need to solve those problems? And, and here, again, agility is really going to be your friend. So uh, for, for us, SaaS or, you know, kind of real agile applications like that are a great way to go for MVP type of process uh, because it's, again, lower barrier to entry. You're, you're starting with some applications that are already built, so you don't need to do, to do anything on that front, and there's no ongoing maintenance. And uh, typically, typically can save you some valuable resources uh, on that side because you're not having to do all the administration. And then uh, also, typically with SaaS applications, you can get more uh, shorter or smaller initial contracts for like a proof of concept or a minimum viable product. That way, you know, in the event it doesn't work out, you're not on the hook for, for too much more. Um, okay, so I'm going to pass it over to Aaron, who's going to cover kind of data scope, which is really what uh, data is necessary to make the minimum viable product happen. Yep, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I guess we'll start with the first point, which is, uh, you know, limiting the data that you'd be interested in. So having to integrate too many sources will make the project complex from both the data integration perspective as well as building analytics on top of that. So as when we discussed, uh, you know, the product functionality, we don't need to have every possible data point or answer every possible question. Instead, we want to balance what data is needed versus what is reasonable for the focus of the MVP. So it's better to reveal the MVP and get feedback, you know, whether positive or negative, but understand where the gaps are going forward than spend a ton of time and effort only to be met with a lack of enthusiasm with what you've built. Um, so in order to do that, um, we, you can determine what data is actually necessary to make effective decisions. Um, this can help drive what data you actually want to use on your MVP. So focus on the core data that will solve customer pain points, those top challenges that you really need to seek to solve with your, with your product. Um, and so that your customers can meet their objectives. Um, and a method to do this uh, is by mapping an analytical workflow to user pain, pain points, which is the next point here. Um, so what steps are your users actually going through uh, within or outside your application uh, to get the answers that they need? Um, so a great way to, to get this feedback is actually to, to ride along or shadow an internal user or a customer power user and actually see how they're using your current application to determine uh, and the best workflow. So if they're using a current workflow where they are in your application but then have to go to another application to get a different data point, you know, maybe consider consolidating those data points so they can uh, both be accessed by your application to make things easier. And then, of course, you're the data expert, so you should be providing your perspective. Um, don't be too responsive to too small a group of users. You should react to feedback, of course, but you're the thought leader in this case. Um, so you should be guiding and sharing your customers the way that you believe is the best way to be using your data product. Um, as we'll be covering in, in the upcoming customer references, you know, your customers come to you for a reason and you have the opportunity to educate them on your point of view and, and how to make your data more productive. And then lastly, don't get hung up on the minor data issues. Feedback like, I want to see six months of historical data and not three. You know, this report takes 10 seconds to render and I'd rather it render in five seconds. You know, is, is, speed, is good feedback, but, um, you know, that can be iterated on uh, as, you, as you build out the product. It shouldn't just be addressed immediately. Um, it can help, you know, you with your next phases of the product especially when it's, you know, super minor, like a color or a, or a performance, you know, issue in the realm of seconds and things like that. So to oh. recap, or do you want to go over this one, Colin? Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so we went over the three, the user scope, the product scope, and the data scope. So, of course, first, what are you trying to achieve in the user scope? Well, who are our users and what are their biggest pain points? The product scope, 
you know, what, what's the minimum functionality needed to solve these problems, and the data scope, you know, what data is necessary to answer those questions. And then ultimately you'll be collecting feedback, iterating, not building the perfect product to start, um, but if it were, whatever works, take that and then build from there. So now we'll be going over some examples of some customers who've used the MVP for their applications. So these will be customers of Looker um, and Kindula. So I'll, I'll first cover the ones that are, that are Looker customers. So the first one is uh, Urban Airship. So for those that aren't familiar with, with Urban Airship, it's a mobile growth company. They basically offer a suite of products to help clients implement customer engagement campaigns through their application, mobile wallet, and website properties. And their XDK actually automatically generates data on behavioral activities which marketers can use to evaluate their campaigns and better interact with users. So the problem was that they had an existing solution but it was only on aggregated data. And they wanted to, a way to extend their current offering um, to provide a more detailed view of the customer. And what was also really important to them was being flexible with their reporting. So they wanted to address non-technical users with um, dashboards, easy to understand reports, uh, but then also service users like a data scientist who would want access to granular data or data extracts. Um, so ultimately, they found that purchasing Looker uh, was not only ideal for its customers, for, but also for its product team versus building you know, a product on their own. And this is because out of the box, it was really easy to embed into their product, so that appealed to their product team. And then also was able to serve all the user types out of the box uh, because Looker you know, ultimately has both dashboarding and granular ex exploration capabilities, you know, within the product itself. Um, so quickly and easily they were able to get to an offering, you know, that was beyond, you know, their, their competitors. Um, and so they could, you know, continue to focus and iterate on creating the best product experience while having that sort of baseline capability of being able to service all of their user types within their application. Um, so with one tool, uh, as, as their head of product said, they could meet the needs of every type of user, you know, and make the work they do for clients repeatable. Um, so it became efficient and scalable for them. And then the next one is PDX, so a little bit uh, different vertical. So PDX is a market leader in pharmacy management software. So actually thousands of pharmacies in the U.S. use PDX products or services to provide patient care, accounting services, and reporting tools for operational management. So prior to Looker, uh, they did only had a text-based way um, to uh, supply that data to their pharmacies. So pharmacies would either have to you know, extract their data or put that in their own data warehouse uh, to actually get reporting. Um, so when they were evaluating tools to help get them started, they realized that Looker you know, could help them get results within the first few days uh, versus weeks and allowed their customers to visualize and slice and dice the data within the product and not have to go through you know, a more cumbersome manner of getting that data out and within the same data warehouse as you know, their financial data or whatever other data that they had. Um, so they found that pulling the data together uh, in a visual way for their clients was a real benefit um, because you know, they had the financial data but they didn't have the operational data uh, in, a, in a usable way and operations for, for pharmacies are things like, you know, how long it takes to perform data entry, you know, which pharmacists have and technicians have the most errors or least errors and things like that. Um, and so now they're able to iterate and continue to, um, you know, provide more and more reporting, you know, by embedding Looker into their product. Now pass awesome. it over to Thank you, Aaron. Uh, so, yeah, just start with a couple of quick Kabula customer stories. Um, so Zoom International, provides call center management. And I mean, if you think about the amount of data coming through a call center, you know, we've all been on the end of the phone sitting there for, you know, hours on end waiting for someone to answer. Well, that's typically because they're taking thousands and thousands of calls a day. Uh, and so really the problem they were having was consolidating all of this data, uh, you know, about, you know, kind of the call and video recordings. And then a big part of any call center is doing QA, uh, right? And having people listen to the calls and monitor and, you know, kind of rate the agents to make sure people are in fact, delivering uh, you know good service, and then also doing speech analytics. So, uh, for this process, from, kind of from the inception, you know, of the minimum viable state, uh, they were really looking for a solution that could help them, kind of in that phase one, uh, as well as then move the solution into production. So, uh, really working with them, 
uh, we took a kind of subset of the data, um, you know, mocked that up, and then actually built out the initial solution to collect user feedback, uh, and then we're able to kind of iterate on that, uh, you know, build out, you know, more historical data uh, and add more data sources, and then make a a larger, you know, kind of final final rollout. Uh, and I was actually met with so much enthusiasm that it ended up uh, being spun off, uh, you know, uh, into a kind of standalone company that did. Uh, kind of data agnostic analytics products. So that's kind of, that's a really cool story. And uh, yeah, their their CEO, uh, you know, obviously really liked not just the strength of the Google platform behind the analytics, but also um, the fact that you know we're always adding access to more data sources or new features on a weekly basis. Uh, you know, being one of the benefits of SaaS, um, and really just the ability to get something up and running sooner and in front of clients, so they could really understand uh, the business case for the analytics they were building out. Uh, and the next one, uh, which is health space, is a actually a pretty cool use case, uh, and they actually do kind of, you know, inspections, and uh, if you think about something like that, uh, you know, it's kind of an old school type of industry where you're literally going on site, uh, making notes on a, on a piece of paper, and then having to submit all of these pieces of paper, you know, once you get back to the office. So the whole idea was uh, to take some of this data, try to automate this process, uh, and, and, you know, again, make the lives of the actual inspectors easier, as well as uh, they kind of uncovered a new vertical uh, that they could resell this technology to. So the idea being they're going to prepackage these analytics, sell them to, you know, kind of restaurant owners or managers and help them understand how, from an inspection standpoint, uh, they compare to other people, not only in their region, but also benchmark that across, uh, you know, the entire nation. So that's a pretty cool thing, and if you think about it, you know, obviously you're putting a lot of uh, trust in somebody when you go into the restaurant to eat. So the fact that you know HealthSpace is able to kind of help restaurants stay ahead of those problems, uh, you know, is, is a really good thing. Um, and uh, again, in this case, they were they were really looking for uh, a partner that they could not only work with from you know a product standpoint to support what they're trying to build, but also um, Really, really liked working with our consulting team, and we always love hearing, uh, you know, good things like uh, like that. Um, so, just kind of a quick intro on the Kabula platform, and then I'll pass it back to Aaron to talk briefly about Looker. Uh, really, Kabula does everything behind the dashboard. So, if you think about it, it's really uh, a collection of pre-built components uh, and you know a, a data engineering platform, for lack of a better comparison. Uh, and really, the idea of being able to collect, combine. Uh, and enhance the data uh, that's going to ultimately support an analytics project, uh, potentially, you know, with with Looker on the front end. So really doing everything to bring data together, make sure it's clean and friendly and automated, so you don't have to worry about managing all those data flows on the back end. So you can really focus on, uh, again, building something uh, and putting it in front of customers and collecting feedback. Because at the end of the day, you want to focus on solving user problems, not you know configuring and managing data. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give an overview of sort of where Kabula fits. Uh, as Colin mentioned, it's a it's a data source for Looker. So the way that that Looker works is that it connects to to SQL data sources, so data warehouses, databases uh, like Kabula. Um, via JDBC, so we don't actually move the data out of the data warehouse or where it's stored. We just connect to it and do all the analytics uh, via SQL in that database. But the way we do that in a scalable manner is through a, a modeling language called TolookML, uh, which is actually an abstraction of SQL that enables you to create what we call dimensions and measures and table relationships that ultimately get exposed to the end user in a click and drop interface from which they can create reports or um, for in the case of a, a data product, the, you know, your, your company can create those reports for your end users um, and expose them, you know, via Looker and de decide on the granularity of data access and, and, and data um, exploration capabilities that they would have, um, but all from that single source of truth. Um, and then this is uh, kind of how Looker differentiates. So first, the data stays in your database, <laughs> as, I, as I just mentioned, which means that the data is as real time as it's being loaded into the database. Uh, so there's no data movement involved. Um, and then that LookML modeling layer guarantees that that consistency of reporting, it's also reusable across your customers. 
um, so that you don't have to be creating uh, custom reports for each one. Um, it really makes it scalable. And then finally, it's a web application. So it's modern, it's easy to embed uh, via iframes. We also have an API so you can surface results from Looker, use it as that data platform for establishing all your definitions for reporting and then expose it into to the end user as in whatever format that you like. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Uh, and, and again, that, I think that's a good point to, to hit home, right? I think with Kabula and Looker, everything's web-based. You don't have to worry about provisioning or managing. And then obviously the release of new features and updates is you know, weekly, if not, if not faster. Uh, and really being able to bring in you know, any data from any location in, in whatever format, not having to worry about that, uh, and really just focusing on solving the business problem. Uh, and again, folks, looking back at the MVP approach, the whole point is speed. So if you're worried about you know, provisioning a data warehouse, building out a bunch of you know, ETL data flows, having to create some sort of custom UI to put on top of it, you know, that's months if not you know, a year plus of development work before you're even actually having a usable product to get in front of users. And the whole point of the MVP analytics is to focus on figuring out their problems and getting something in front of users faster so you can figure out if you're on, if you're on the right track. Uh, so it's really creating kind of an agile approach to uh, embedded analytics, uh, letting you adapt through the process uh, and collecting user feedback to figure out, you know, in fact, what the users want. And from an architectural standpoint, you know, kind of this is where Kabula and Looker sit together. And obviously with, with Kabula, we're, you know, backed by Snowflake Data Warehouse. So when you're combining Looker and Kabula, it's really a full stack modern BI solution, you know. Um, and the whole idea is to be able to support your, you know, first iteration of building something to put in front of, you know, maybe tens of users that will then scale up into an in production in front of thousands of, you know, your end customer users. Uh, so the whole idea is you don't have to worry about the technology at all. You're really just focusing on uh, solving the business problems. Do you want to add anything here, Aaron? No, I think that was a good overview. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I do have time for uh, a couple of questions, and then we'll wrap up for the day. So, uh, Aaron, thank you, and obviously thanks everyone for joining. So uh, let's just get into a couple of questions, and then we'll, we'll wrap up for the day. So what's the best way to determine the balance between too little and too much for the minimum viable product? Uh, and that's a really good question. And, and I think it really just goes back to kind of point one, which is who is your user and what are their top pain points? So the whole point is, uh, you know, as Aaron, as Aaron alluded to, you know, if you're going out of the application to get some data, that there you go, there's a pain point. That's, you know, five or 10 minutes of their day where they have to do something else. There's number one. Uh, and again, if you're riding along with somebody in your application and actually seeing where they're running into troubles, this is where you can figure out those top two to three pain points. It's really important to focus on like a critical, mission critical issue, not just something that's nice to have. Uh, and then based on that, what's the minimum amount of product functionality and data you need to solve those problems? And, that, and that's all you need to worry about. If you're doing anything about you know, colors or, you know, things like that. I, I think in this phase, it's just kind of a waste. So it, it's almost, you know, right on a piece of paper, what's the stuff we have to deliver? Uh, what's the stuff that, you know, may, maybe we need in the next phase? And then, you know, what's this not going to do? And that, I think that's really important to remember too. What's the whole point of what you're building and what's stuff that isn't, right? And if you're just, focusing on things outside of those kind of boundaries, that's when you're gonna get into the, the part of the MVP process where you're gonna waste you know, time and development resources doing stuff that you shouldn't be doing right now. Uh, again, you do wanna collect user feedback and it is valuable, but it's not something you need to worry about in the very first phase of your, your build out. Those, those are really things that you should take note of and you know, put on the roadmap for phase two or phase three. Uh, let's see, next question. How can you start with limited data sources if all of the data is required for analytics? And I think that, that can be one of the big challenges too, right? You, you want to have 10 years of historical data and you want to connect to you know, 80 different data sources. And it's good to have those things in mind and also you know, there, there may be a place to do that. But again, the whole point here is determining the business viability of like solving those pain points or answering those questions that your users have. So, uh, 
again, these are good things to take note of. If you build out six months of historical data into your, your minimum viable analytics product, then your user says, yeah, well, it'd be nice if that was a year. Okay, great. That's a problem you can solve. But uh, if you're going to actually spend out time, you know, 18 months building out all the data source stuff before you get something in front of users, you're again sacrificing the speed of the actual approach for something that might, at the end of the day, not help them uh, make their work life easier with, within your application. So those are definitely questions that uh, you should take note of or things you should take note of as far as like, okay, I wish I had Google Analytics data, but those are easy problems to solve in the next phase. Um, but again, the whole point being like, is this actually a business viable analytics solution for the people using it? And then uh, let's see, I think we got one or two more. So sh should you charge for the minimum viable product since it's essentially a learning method? Um, I would say you can. So uh, this is one of the big things that we work on in our product workshops and product assessment, but the first thing you, you need to ask yourself, right, is is, the, is this analytics that you're putting in front of people actually adding value? And I think it, at the end of the day, whether it's a MVP or, you know, in-production product, you can charge money if you're adding value and making their life easier. Uh, one, one of the things to keep in mind is what is your current product pricing structure? So how do you charge your users today and how are your users used to uh, you know, kind of working with you on those things or on new features. If they're used to paying for, you know, new additional features, yeah, I think you definitely can charge. If they're typically not and it's really just they pay you a one-time flat fee and they get every bell and whistle that you have, I think you might have a tougher sell. Um, and another thing to keep in, line, in mind would be, are you planning on charging for these analytics after the MVP phase? Uh, so if that's the case, yeah, I think you, 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 you could potentially charge too. But the big one would be, you know, how are they used to engaging with you from that uh, kind of pricing side of things? And then, uh, you know, what's your ultimate plan after the MVP phase? And then I think the big one, again, is just how much value you're adding. If you're adding a lot of value, you can charge. Uh, and then how you do that, again, that's a, a much longer conversation I'm sure we'll get into in a future webinar. Um, and then the next one being, uh, how do you make the transition from minimum viable product to kind of real product. So that's a, <laughs> that's a good one. So it, it needs to be, again, back to, I think I mentioned it in the, the outset, which is this needs to be part of a larger plan. So if you're asking that question at the end of your kind of minimum viable product phase and it's like, okay, we actually have some uh, excited users, what do we do next? So you're definitely uh, behind the A-ball. It's something that you should be thinking before you even, you know, start thinking about, you know, technology or, or what you're going to uh, actually actually build. Uh, it should be part of the initial planning phase. So again, minimum viable product is really part of a larger product rollout. So uh, one of the things that we've seen, again, knowing that's the strategy, not the technology that often de derails these projects. If you're not thinking about you know, phase two and phase three before you even start the thing, that's gonna be a huge challenge. So you should know that if after you know, one month or two months of feedback, we get a green light from our users and they really love it, already know what, what you're gonna do next. Um, and then based on that, you know, what are you gonna do next? If, if you're, yeah, again, if you're asking this question at the end, you're in trouble. So make sure that you really have in mind, you know, if this, if this happens, what are we going to do next? If this happens, what are we going to do next? Um, and this should be, a, you know, a huge, you should really have a, a, an analytics product roadmap for the next things you're going to build. Uh, and again, the feedback that you get in this initial process should influence uh, the next phase, but you should already have in mind what the next phase is going to be. I think, let's see, I think that's all the questions we have. So let's just do some housekeeping to wrap things up. Um, so, Aaron, awesome. Thank you. Thank you again for joining. Really uh, appreciated having you on the webinar today. Um, obviously, a link to the recording will be sent out after. Um, here's Aaron and I's contact info. If you have questions about Looker or you have questions about Kabula, please reach out to us respectively. Uh, and obviously, if you have you know a project or a you know minimum viable analytics uh, product you want to talk about, please reach out to us. Um, and 
we will be resuming the webinar series in January. We're taking next month off for the holidays. But hope you'll join us again. And you know, thanks everyone for joining. Hope you have a great day. Do you have anything else you want to add, Aaron? Yeah, sounds good. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. And again, uh, recording will go out later today. And please uh, join us again. Thanks so much.